examples. Um, you know, sometimes man pages are not so great. And this is how we start with Firewall D. So I am going to try to switch over, if I can, to my little demo. I have these two VMs. Yep. That isn't displaying. Was it 250? I thought it was two. It might be a capacity. It was capacity. Well, that's okay because we got to get it. We're still having technical difficulties. Is it 215? Do you all want to wait? No. Can you help me with this? Why it isn't displaying? <laughs> it's on the wrong screen. Okay. The trick is, is that you're actually on two display. You're two. You have two screens, and you need to drag your VMs over to that display. Or turn mirroring on. There? Yeah. Let's see. Which way? Ah, there we go. There we go. And how do I switch back and forth? Uh, you move the mouse. Okay, so. Well, I guess I should. We, since we're going to start officially, I should tell you that I'm with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as well. We moved there in 2005. It's on the east side of the state where it's very, very dry. Uh, I thought I was going to the Northwest. Believe me, they're not. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this whole talk has gone over in multiple variations in my head. Even last night, I was still going, oh, this, I don't understand this. How can I explain something that I don't really understand well? And what I had to come through this process was, how do I think about doing firewalls with IP tables, IP set, my background prior to learning IP tables was Cisco. You know, you have all your packets coming into this one funnel. Packet, read it, I got a rule. Match, no match. Come down, you know, all the way through, throw things out. It's a, just a very straight linear process. When you get to fi uh, IP tables, you have a file that you look at. And I can go in and edit. My colleague can go in and edit. We're basically still going to stay with the same structure. Now, I have supported groups. When I went in and I had to make changes to their firewall, they were only, I only put my changes in at the top of their IP tables via because whatever they had going on, if I added it at the end, my stuff wasn't going to get executed. So, But support for IP tables, the concept of how it goes down is very linear. You've got a packet come in. Then you match a rule, and at the first match, that's what the computer does. If it falls through, it's discarded. Uh, IP sets is a super neat utility. I learned about it a couple of years ago. People talk about using it for blacklisting. I use it for whitelisting, but not in the traditional sense of allowing sites in. IP sets was a utility developed to manage groups of things in NetFilter. It is very fast and efficient, but what I like about it is it reduces the number of times I have to go into the IP tables file and make changes there. Less typos. I don't restart the firewall. Uh, when I add uh, an IP address to my set list, it does some basic syntax checking. So my commas get flagged before they ever get entered. And it takes effect immediately. Um, I had a discussion earlier this week with a senior admin where I work. And he goes, well, you're obfuscating where the IPs are listed. You know, you have to go look somewhere else. Somebody could sneak an IP in there. My last comment to him after I talked about efficiency, ease of use, it scales super well. Not that I have a huge, I don't have a heavy lift compared to a website or something that's on the internet. Uh, you're gonna love IP, uh, Firewall D and I do not make that in a good, good sense simply because Firewall D does not do things, is not organized the same as IP tables. When you first go out and you read about it, oh, it's a wrapper around IP tables. It's not what I'd call a wrapper, yeah. It's not a one for one. It does things very differently, it has some very different conceptions in here. 
Let's see if I can get back. You said I just moved the mouse over here? Uh, you should be able to just uh, move it. It's moving. <laughs> it's not moving the way I want. Uh, I am having technical difficulties here. We can always swap displays. Let's try that. I apologize, folks. I don't normally. The work laptop was not going to come here. Hmm, that's not. Hmm. Not there. When in doubt, oh, there I am. Oh, okay. I'm not seeing that. Okay, peaches. Can you click in it? No. barely see in it. The mouse is over here on the right. That far? Yep. There you go. Yep. Now you're off the screen. Would you rather try to run it mirrored so you see it on yeah. the displays? How would you do that? Or a man. Oh, did it come up? Yeah. I think you're now. It's on here now. That's not what we want. Yeah, the mirror would probably be easier. Yeah, I'm going to try to get it here. Display arrangement. There you go. You should be good now. Okay. There we go. There is my web server. And Cream is my little client. This is not fancy. This isn't going to cover a lot, but this is going to cover basics. There's three ways to configure Firewall D. I'm just going to focus on the command line, this firewall dash command. There is a huge laundry list of things that you can do with it. <laughs> and you get lost in the helps, you know, gets, lists, and whatever. You do you can do a lot of your configuration just with this one command but you got to know all the options and it's like do i list do i get and when do i do what i could not find a good cheat sheet when i went searching online probably if i had time and had thought about this a couple of months ago <laughs> one of the things i should have developed for this presentation is a cheat sheet but you'll find you know there is a lot written about using the basics of Firewall D. What struck me when I started going through this was people were asking the same kinds of questions over and over and over again. Uh, in fact, I saw a posting on one of the mailing lists within the time period of me putting together this present with one of the same questions I was struggling with. So, And that struck me a lot. You know, IP tables, you go learn your basic syntax. IP tables insert, IP tables in, uh, append. 
source IP, destination IP, port, accept or drop. Um, the learning curve for Firewall D is a lot steeper, at least that's my experience with it. It doesn't do things the same way. I struggled for a long time coming out, well, where do I do my logging? Things like that. Anyway, this is our firewall. That's all there is to it. There's a lot more to that, but this is where we start. We have a firewall. So that people in the corner would like you to make it a bit bigger. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, control plus, make your terminal window bigger for the font size. size. Oh, VM. It's a VM. Yeah, mm. Might not work. No. There's like under view, there would be a zoom option. Up at the top. Yeah, maybe zoom. Yeah. Scale. Scale factor to like 200 or something. No, cancel. And then scale factor at the bottom of view. Oh, view. This is kind of the default you get on a firewall when you start. First of all, Firewall D comes with a lot of preset configurations done for you. Uh, we'll go get into that in a minute. But the little demo I'm going to have here is I have, I've got a web server and I have a client. And as you can see from my client, I can log into my web server. And now I want to lock down my web server. So I can't do this. I want Peaches only to be a web server. There we go. So I'm going to do this, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Do you have an equal sign in front? No. Oh, well, my typo. Oh. At the end of this, I have my contact information. I don't think Linux Fest has a place to uh, post slides, but you can send me email. I'll be glad to send this to you. I want to allow HTTP. So I'm going to add something called a service. A service is a predefined collection of ports and or protocols. So Firewall D has these added to it. I'm going to list everything I've got now. And you can see now I have a service here called HTTP. And what does that do? That says, well, now I will accept. I have always found difficult to, to find a list of these services. We can handle that. First of all, there's a couple of commands. Fi Ultimately, Firewall D does everything in files. XML files. Okay. You these are the system for firewall D, their default files. There is defaults for services and zones. We'll talk about what those are in a little bit. Lots. There are more ending. going to need my cheat sheet in here. There's one for yeah. 
and well I'm either typing all or my cheat sheet is wrong but there is a firewall command that lists them all and it's extensive and yours, ours, whatever we customize, goes into Etsy. Right now, I don't have anything in here. We'll talk about zones in a minute. Uh, so you basically have zones and services. So. So a zone, I read the definition. I read it and I read it. And I sort of made sense to me. And what I finally got through my mind is Firewall D set up some pre-configured defaults because most firewall situations involve a limited number of sets of, cir of circumstances. So you have a zone and you want to put your computer on a DMZ, it's going to be on an internal network. It might be on a public network like you're down at Starbucks. Uh, you might be on a home. Well, they've got, what they did was they married this idea of there are different type, networks have different levels of trustworthiness or vulnerabilities. So they're giving you some pre-configurations you can use or not that make it easier to select what, what you want. And so they say, okay, we have this concept of your internal zone is like your work zone. Your public zone might be something more, uh, less trusty. Internal at work, you trust most everybody. So we're going to give you that, and it's going to provide a limited number of predefined services, which are SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, Samba, you let name the list. That list is long. If you go to the public zone, and how do I know? Well, this is kind of hop hopscotch. This command tells you on your zone the basics. You are in the public zone. It defined by default the service allowed was SSH, DHCP, V6 client. I added HTTP. Now, right now, my client can still SSH in. I haven't closed that off. See if this works. And on my client, you now see I can get my little web page. But I don't want people logging into this thing with SSH. Ah, oh, come on, don't do that to me. So I would do Now I see here, you know, in the service, I no longer have SSH. And if you go to Peaches, it says I can't connect. So this is pretty simple, but this is, just didn't connect with me when I was trying to do Firewall D. Because... IP tables looks really different. <laughs> the first time I hit this, I went, well, where's my stuff? Um, you've got all these chains in here. Uh, how do I see what I have? And... That's where grep comes in handy. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> you can't grep when you're looking for except for you've got multiple targets. Okay, 
So now we see HTTP, we didn't know. Um, one of the things that Firewall D provides for you is a runtime environment, which is what you're currently executing, versus a permanent environment. And that permanent environment is defined by what are all in those XML files. Um, you manage all that through either editing the XML files directly through this firewall-command command line, and there's a graphical interface too, which I'm not going to talk about because I live in a server environment. I don't have graphics. Also, the graphical isn't going to be able to do you IP tables. So the idea with Firewall D is you have your runtime environment. You make your changes there. You see if it's what you want. When you've got everything the way you want it, you do this. You say, I want to make it permanent. I could type. And what I'm going to do is get rid of that DHCP for version 6, because I don't want that on my web server. A couple of things here. When you don't have that permanent option, I'm just affecting the runtime. And if you read the documentation and you go to a lot of the postings on say how to, um, And I've got references for some of the things that helped me. Um, they say do that. So one of the first things I ran into, because of course I couldn't just start off with this basic little thing, was uh, I ran into a situation where I had to reload. So you can't entirely use this runtime versus permanent. Get your, like they talk about in the documentation, get everything nice, save it one time and you're fine. Um, there are some situations where you're forced to reload. So another thing is once you've got a working configuration and you save it with um, that permanent option, and let's see if this has had enough time to update. Now, these, these are the XML files in my user's copy. You can edit them directly if you want, and there's stuff online that tells you about them. It's not really hard to do. Copy one and go edit it. It's not a big deal. And, but what the neat thing is, is Firewall D will automatically refresh itself. And I'm not sure what the time period it was, because I haven't timed it, but it's, it's a few minutes. It's, it, it goes into effect. But as soon as you do this, That reload takes what's in your runtime configuration, reloads from the permanent configuration, the files. So if you haven't saved something with that permanent thing, gone. This kind of simple thing, you're really not going to see a difference, but that can affect you. And I thought I removed that. See? Adding and removing services are pretty level at this.
Now I've taken my runtime and I've saved it all. The files will update themselves automatically. That permanent con configuration persists past a re reload, reboot, restart. Um, so one of the first things I did was kept thinking, and part of my problem was this, is I kept trying to do the simple things, like I think are simple with the IP tables. And I did not understand this concept of how firewall deals with zones, how it deals with saving things, and um, I did not understand that adding a service like HTTP, which also can be done by add a port. You don't have to do add service. You can just say add port. Port equals 80. That works. And I really didn't understand this concept of zones. So if we are, we can't SH, SSH, no route to host. And we can curl. Yep. So you see how easy it is to start. I went from the services to ports. It makes more sense to me to talk about port 80. Well, Red Hat Firewall D really, really wants you to use add service and not do add port. <clears throat> so the first line of setting up one is through this. And you can launch it through that, and now you've got your little basic. But if you add back in, and I'm not great on typing, especially when anybody's watching. So if you look at this, I've got HTTPS, I've got HTTP, and I've got SSH. Well, look at this IP tables chain. Where does it say the SSH is coming from? Anywhere. When I learned, when I was setting up the firewalls with IP tables, you know, I, I've got a group of servers. We're internal. Um, we still took the approach of limiting who could SSH to. I took it to heart about know your traffic. Limit what's coming in to what you want to accept. Don't allow just anybody. So I had spent a lot of time looking at IP tables logging things to see what was valid tra coming in uh, because the most I got from the Oracle DBAs was I need port 1521 and past that it was up to me to figure out what else was being used. And yes, I could do a uh, net stat and figure out what ports it was listening on, but what I ran into was, oh, only XYZ uses 3272. Nobody else should be using it. So I really took it to heart of trying to limit who can come in. Plus, I got ticked off at our security department who was scanning the heck out of me, and I couldn't. So I learned how to drop things. Uh, let's get back over to the presentation. Well, I'm not permitted to run NNAP where I exist in my department. Yeah. Um, only certain groups are allowed to do that, and I'm not one lucky. If you're ethical, it works great. If you're unethical, it's like stay away. <laughs> well, they used to enforce it a lot more than they do. But for me, you know, so I never got in the habit of using NNAP. So I've talked to other, we've got three groups where I work who are moving into firewall uh, system D actually. And I talked to the people and I heard one very senior, I want to do it the right way. Um, I haven't figured out what the right way is yet with firewall D. So how do you verify it if you can't verify it? Ah, that's a good idea. I don't, you can do a TCP dump. You can go out and you can run a TCP, uh, do a packet capture afterwards. 
You can just do what I did, so test for one inch. So you are permitted to use wire shire, but no. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I do these days because things have, okay, things have changed where I, where I work. But, um, but yeah, you know, there, there, there are still discussions going on on how we're going to do this. Uh, I'm not externally available. Uh, the security people are saying I should have everything open to them, but they keep changing their IP subnet. Um, we don't accommodate emails. Personally, they haven't told me that to my face yet, so I do drop them a different way, and I'm fixing to make that a scriptable thing. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, it's like, first of all, I couldn't log the way I was used to. Well, how do you log? I couldn't figure out what this zone configuration really did for you. Uh, how do you go from this service, which allows everybody to come in, to something more restrictive? What can I do and not do? And like I said, when I was reading about this, I would find postings, and people are asking the same questions. It doesn't matter. IP, ta um, IP tables has been around since like 90, 1998, and Firewall D was released with Fedora 15 in 2005. A lot more history with IP tables, a lot more platform independence. You know, Fire, uh, Red Hat's been pushing it, and other distros are picking it up. But, you know, it just doesn't happen. And if you read the documentation in Red Hat, and you read the documentation in, Fire, in Fedora, yeah, it's there, but I'm kind of slow. I mean, it, it just didn't, they didn't just say, do this. And yes, that firewall dash command is simplified, but if you go read the man pages, it gets just as hairy as some of the most more esoteric things with IP tables. Um, okay, this is where I started off with zones, and we'll talk about this a little bit. And it talks about a level of trust. Well, I don't have, I don't support laptops that move or networks. You know, it's not like my Mac that remembers when I get to school or remembers at home. My servers stay in one thing. And the zones are nice. And we'll talk about some of that a little bit later. You can use the nine predefined zones. They're called public, internal, home, DMZ, Things, uh, there's a trusted, there's a reject, there's a drop. A reject gives an INCMP denied, and the drop just drops. Uh, the trusted, and those three you can't change. But you can create your own, so don't feel confined to that, but you don't have to. Um, I read and I read and read. I got into this about traffic sources are des designated either by your network interface or source IP. Let's see. I'm not sure if we can move back and forth real easy. You have to have at least one active zone. Now here's the catch on that. It doesn't have to be one with an interface in it. As long as you have bound through a specific parameter called ad source, a, an IP address or a network to that zone, it is active. I'm not quite sure why you want to have a zone. If you have only one zone, why you wouldn't have it bound to your interface. But one of my coworkers is playing around with that right now. And it works just fine. It just kind of threw me the first time I saw him do this, which was earlier this week. You do have to specify a default zone so that if you have only one active, that's your default. You can define it in one of two places, um, the NIC script, or there is a, a file, firewalld.com, you know, pretty obvious in that Etsy firewalld directory. I can see where this might be useful. So say somebody brings an iPhone or smartphone to a place of business, and then you don't know the MAC address of that device, but you 
assign it an IP, you can throw that in a zone and be like, you know, all traffic to and from that device is in this zone. And I read something written early, early on, this is really old, from Fedora, where the idea was that network manager would manage your interfaces, would manage which networks they were on, and would be sort of like when my Mac goes to school, it recognizes the school network or things like that. Yeah. My servers don't do that. Uh, we won't go into going from a network, because um, that's going to be really dependent. I was trying to think of what you said, but yeah. And there are cases for using multi-zones, but we're real simple folks. We're just trying to figure out what the heck this is. Um, and so we started off with just using a zone. And it doesn't matter if you take public, which is the default from when you build a CentOS box, um, or you set it, but you have, do have to set it in one of those two files. Now here's the other gotcha that they don't really tell you. They say, oh yeah, changing interface and what zones is real easy, just do your firewall command set interface, that sort of thing. Not if network manager is running. <laughs> network manager owns things and it expects to be in control of things. So uh, the documentation doesn't really clearly state that out for you. So we had a reboot and guess what? We were back to what network manager had said we were running. And um, Zone is more like it gets to be just I had it and I lost yeah, it. and that's kind of that is kind of how I've been with this, and it's like, what is going on here? Why doesn't it act like the way I think it should act? Because I've been with open route, which is firmware on my router, and it's got zone, so it's yeah. got my internet zone, it's got my internal zone, it's got DMZ zones. And that is a more advanced usage of this, yeah, but okay. you are not going to see it when you go into the entry stuff of how to. And each zone can have its own rules, uh, uh, firewall rules. Yeah. Oh, so, not it can. Yeah. Does. It does. Yeah, yeah. If I could type. Right. So, so a smartphone on here. On your, your firewall, you don't want to have the same rules as say a Well, server. no, you don't. But okay. let's start off simple on this, going, ah, what is all this doing? Right. No, well, that was my problem. One of them, many of them. Is I started to try and do what I typically do. Yeah. And I had a conversation with a gentleman, you know, well, how, I can't get around this logging. Where do I log? It doesn't log, you know. I tore my hair out a lot if you can't tell that. <laughs> Uh, if you look at this, is this the one high up? You can see interfaces, but you can define a zone without an interface. All you have to do Okay, so you could, this is the magic that binds an IP and I'm going to throw one in here that I haven't talked about. You can specify which zone. So oh, these double quote these double dashes would kill me. So now I have my internal zone, which we haven't looked at yet, mind you. But it says 10.0.2.15 can come in. It's bound. Uh, it does not have an interface.
And there are so many lists and gets, and I'm still struggling with it. And at least with open route, you attach a network to a node. Like my WAN network to the it's WAN zone. Right. It's dead active. Yeah. And my LAN network to my LAN zone, and so on and so forth. Now I have two zones. And, and my guest network to my guest zone. And now notice that since SSH was defined for the internal zone, that's a default. Again, you can use all of these defaults as is. Other people just start off with their own zone saying, I can't touch them. Doesn't matter. Your preference. If you're looking at Far uh, Fedora, in fact, when you do this install, they provide another zone for their stuff to use. You know? So you look at that and go, oh, okay. I'm not too sure about this zones, but why would I do it? Because I want we're where we are, we're just doing one zone. There's some advantages to that. Um, you know, in IP tables, we had one file. It had a single format. You could jump around all you wanted to, but for basics, you didn't have to. When you go into Firewall D, you got to start dealing with the fact that you're going to have a set of files for every zone that you use, and they're different. You can, and I saw this posted, it was actually a question I'd had too. <clears throat> okay, I've done my playing around. I inadvertently had to do dash dash reload because somewhere in there, because something wouldn't work, I did a permanent. How do I clean out and get back to square one? Well, you can make a copy of your public, or if you're using an internal, and just copy it back in. If you have any files in the services, you just delete them out. You can copy files from that user log firewall D, whether it to be services or zones, and you're back to square one. And I went, oh, that's too simple. Why didn't I get it? Um, That's one, that's one use case. Yeah. This was just, could I set up something that went back and forth and didn't have all the defaults that I get when I get a new VM at work so I can just see where things are going? And I could add and I could. So let me show you one thing in the sense that Fire, uh, Firewall D says they have all these services you can add, you can add. But you can go in and do add port. And I'm not gonna set up Samba. I'm just going to show you what I did and found out Samba didn't work. And I missed a double dash. got to be careful um, some thought. There are some examples online, nothing recent, by within I mean the last year or so, of doing multi-zone. There's some real good advantages to doing that. There's some real downsides. We have more control, I see. You can, and it's a nice way. It looks really nice, and it looks like, oh, I have really organized my stuff well. Performance impact. Yeah. If you've got a high traffic system, uh, and most of my stuff isn't, so it wouldn't matter one way or the other. Um, but 
when we first do, started doing host space firewalls, which was just like five years ago on our servers, I got the Oracle servers, big, big giant guys. That was the one where the DBA said, I need such and such a port and didn't tell me who all and what else needs to come in. And I started logging because that's, there was a talk here a couple of years ago about using IP tables, setting it up. So I took it to heart. So I started logging just to start learning what was going on. Uh, log all. That poor little box just went thump. <laughs> so I learned how to lo limit my logging <laughs> real quick. Uh, but another thing I've learned by watching the IP tables logging on my IP tables is I have got servers that are behind our F5, which is a proxy firewall. They use it for load balancing. And that thing just beats up these servers like, you know, every, every it's less than a minute. It was, it was less, every five seconds, less than that. Hit, hit, hit. And that's the biggest hitter. So on those servers, I want that traffic processed and out of the way. Um, also, I don't want to look at it when I'm looking at the table, <laughs> you know, the logs. Uh, <clears throat> yep. And that's interesting. That pulled Samba client. Now, this is what I get for working on one rel hat and trying to do on a different distro. <clears throat> Let's do this another way, and it will take it to our next. And what I wanted to do with this, and I'm not quite sure without actually setting up Samba and letting it sit a while while it percolates and setting up a Samba domain. If you want to I'll get you to this in a minute. This looks hairy. And it's act Peck? Missing an A. Missing an A. I don't like doing this is I don't like doing this. This is there's too much rife. But It's called a rich rule. And we'll take a look at the syntax in just a minute. Rich rules are the next step up from the direct or standard rules, um, where you just do firewall command add, you know, whatever, or firewall command remove. And that, boy, now you see rich rules. And you go, why do I do rich rules? Rich rules are used to list specifics. You know, you don't want everybody. Now this is just, in a real network I just started doing Assuming you have your printers on a different VLAN than the rest of it, then your accounting. Okay, let's go back to here, and we'll, we'll get. I'm just trying to put my head around. Like, yeah, you, and you and you get, you're actually. I jumped over into that end before going through this. This is just a long laundry list, do a man, firewall command, you know, you can't remember the typing, you know. This is pretty simple, but it's like I got hung up with, 
I don't want everybody SSHing into my servers. Because that's not how we had it set up in Rel 6. Yeah. And the syntax for the basics, you know, add service, remove service. Ah, oh, get services, the one I couldn't remember. And let me introduce you here another concept. Firewall D is a work in progress. Yeah. Okay. This changes between releases. The list of available predefined services. Okay, okay. So the syntax of the command doesn't change. Doesn't change. <laughs> it's what it returns. From what I've gathered, and this is not in the Red Hat documentation that I've read, if you use the direct uh, the standard rules, and if you use the rich rules, which we're starting to talk about now, um, different you know if firewall D gets upgraded, it will support that. There is another class of rules called direct rules. And that direct rules, you simply insert your own IP table syntax directly in there. Firewall D doesn't track those changes. This is the simplified form of the rich rule syntax. This is a moderately detailed syntax. And I went, huh? But this actually isn't as hairy as it appears to be on first appearance. You can get good examples from the man pages. Fedora, and I have this in context, Fedora has a ritual language wiki that is just superb. You know, if you follow an example, stick in your numbers, it'll work real quick and easy for you. Your real power in Firewall D comes from doing the rich rules where you can um, specify so you can limit who comes in. You can specify who, who doesn't come in. Okay. Um, can, you, can you edit IP tables directly in a firewall being set up? You don't have it anymore. You don't have an IP tables file anymore. You do have the XML files for Firewall D, and yes, those you can edit directly. That is a legitimate means of updating things, is edit those files, create your own. You can still run the IP tables command. Really. You can write the IP tables command, yes, to look at things, but you don't have an IP tables file to edit. IP tables cannot execute while Firewall D executes. They are mutually exclusive. Firewall D does use IP tables, but not the IP tables dot service. So if you look, you will see one of the IP tables packages there, but not IP tables dot service. So you can't edit. There's no file to edit. Your, the direct rules, do they end up in an XML anywhere? Yeah. They do? Mm -hmm. And that Etsy firewall D directory. Firewall D, uh, okay, let's, is everybody sort of familiar with IP sets? Okay, it's just a nice way to add things so you don't have to type all these commands. You know, you get it down once and then you just deal with your IP addresses. Um, so this was what this was. I really like IP sets because it makes my life easier because I'm a lousy typist. Um, direct rules. After, let's see if I've got a more example. Oh, here's the big thing you got to do for logging. This is where I started off with how do I log. Rich rule is where you get into logging. You can only log that rule. You can either log the acceptance or the drop. It doesn't log anything else. Um, direct rules are just your IP table syntax. It's your, also, if you want outbound filters, you're going to have to do direct rules. But Firewall D just passes that on to NetFilter, and it doesn't track any changes or whatever. Um, this was the other thing that I really bounced against, and you won't find it very readily. Red Hat doesn't talk about it, at least in their introductory 
you know, guide to hardening, that sort of thing. So your direct rules, which are your IP table syntax, go are the processed first, then your source zones, the ones that you've done, add source parameter. And then if you have a zone with an interface in it, that's processed. And lastly, by your default, because that may be different from the first two. Now understand a zone can be a source zone. It can be a NIC zone, or it can be both, or it can be neither. Well, it can't be neither because it has to be at least one, but it can be both. It can be both a source zone and a NIC zone. Within the zone, the priority of processing is logged and I allow. That's for everything. Now, if you have a group of rules, then you get rich rules, ports, and services. So if you add in your process, you're not guaranteed a finite fixed ordering. Anytime you change your firewall D, it's going to reorder things. That has driven a colleague of mine up the wall because he wants, and I agree with him, I, I, I'm used to doing that, you know, a fix because I, in that where I have that proxy firewall in front of everybody, I want that rule that says, okay, accept those addresses and just get on with it. I want that up top. And it makes a, even in my relatively low key, it, it can make a difference in the processing load. So, which rule? Standard rules apply to all traffic. They aren't limited as to where the source comes from. You know, is it allow, is all traffic's allowed on that service? It doesn't matter where it comes from. You use a rich rule to say, okay, only accept it from this source or this IP address or that network. Um, a direct rule is used when you can't do what you need to do with the other two. And back, let's see if I can get out of this and get over. Come on, come on, come on. There are things that Firewall D does under the um, hood that it doesn't talk about. I did, I was playing around the other night and I added my ports through a rich rule for Samba. Samba wouldn't work, Samba wouldn't work. XML files. I ran into connection tracking monsters. We have to use those, specify those when we run on our FTP server. But you know, in IP tables, I just mentioned the ports and my Samba works and anything else. Firewall D doesn't. And it doesn't tell you you have to have this. You have to look at these files to know that you also have to load a connection tracking module. So my rich rule opening that port, it just didn't work until I looked at this file and said, oh, so, since we are real short of time, and I knew this was going to be here are the if I haven't already tell, I had a hard time talking about firewall D and not ranting. Uh, I am not the only one. Uh, people probably don't. The people that I work with are three groups. When you talk to them, uh, like a couple of weeks ago. I didn't know you could use more than one zone at a time. Um, some of the stuff is just not intuitive to the way we've been using IP tables. That multiple levels of precedence in the ordering drives me nuts, but what drives me much more is the documentation. Uh, Underdocumented is just a really polite way I found somebody put it. Uh, another thing is if you go and start reading other people's postings, just be aware that what they say may be applicable to the version that they were using at the time they wrote it. I mean, I'm reading really old posts trying to figure out how does this all fit together. Um, I read one on this multi-zone thing, finishing up. You gotta wrap it up. Okay. And it said you couldn't have a zone that didn't, you couldn't have at least one zone without an interface. Wrong. It works just fine with no zones in an interface, as long as you have your active zone being a source zone. 
you do have to have an active zone. If you have one zone, that is your default zone. Documentation just doesn't get updated in a timely manner, if you can find it. Stuff that really tells you what's going on under the hood. There's a real lack of transparency. They tell you don't use the direct rules. It's too dangerous. It's the only thing I've been able to find on Red Hat's site about not using IP table syntax. And I'm going, well, you know, yeah, I've shut myself out and had to drive to another campus to get into the console. Who hasn't? Uh, I've taken things down. Yep, you learn real quick. Well, now they're telling people, no, well, don't use it. It's too dangerous. Um, but the catch-22 is there's only some things you can do with direct rules. And firewall leaves you no, uh, firewall D leaves you no alternative. If you want to filter your outbound tra traffic, you must do it through a direct rule. Firewall D applies to incoming uh, traffic by default. If you want to specify a fixed order of processing for whatever reason, and if you are in a high traffic zone where you've got a big load and you really want to get rid of that load quick, you must do it through a direct rule. Again, work in progress. From Stack Overflow. It just isn't intuitive. It doesn't fit into how we were taught to think when it came with IP tables with Cisco. Just the typical bring in a packet. We have the next group coming in. Okay, I'm out of here. Email me. I have some good references in here. And I apologize for jumping through this like this. It should have been more appropriate to the time. Thank you very much.